Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Jinnah Institute's webinar on um, the COVID scenario. The ongoing series of discussions has looked at the government's policy responses as well as transformations that are happening in society and the responses it has forced out of us collectively or individually. Uh, we commissioned a report and we, have, we were lucky to have um, senior experts who wrote uh, for this report and um, we're lucky to have them today also to, to speak about what they wrote in this report. The report was looking at COVID responses in key policy sectors. We were also hoping that we might be publishing this report in a post-COVID scenario, but until the vaccine rolls out, we're pretty sure we will not see a post-COVID uh, future. But all the same, we tried guessing at what a future may look like with or without the vac vaccine and how policy sectors and decision makers and institutions and procedures might change as a result. If there have been fundamental transformations, we'll put that question to our experts. We're, we're happy to have with us Ms. Safiya Aftab, prominent economist, Mr. Rafi Alam, prominent lawyer, and environmentalist, and Mr. Osama Khilji, activist, and, um, uh, you know, he's leading the, the charge against, uh, against many things in Pakistan. Osama, perhaps we'll find an opportunity to talk about tech also a little bit. Uh, and, and with that, if I could invite Safiya Aftab to share her perspectives on what she wrote and what she thought. Over to you, Safiya. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be brief because I don't think we have a lot of time. Um, I think there have been both positives and negatives, um, but I'm afraid uh, I'm seeing more negatives than positives. I think uh, the response of the government started off well. Um, you know, there was a bit of a delay, uh, you know, in acknowledging that the problem had arrived. But in fact, it, it, you know, after once the uh, first few cases had been registered, there was a good response in the sense that the NCOC was formed by the end of March. Uh, there was an effort to really bring together to, uh, people together on one forum and to bring the provinces together with the federal government on that forum. And that was very positive given that provincial and federal coordination has historically always been a problem in Pakistan. Um, what happened uh, was that the NCOC was really um, uh, behind the scenes was an initiative of the armed forces and you know they were the ones who sort of uh, informally strong armed everyone to come onto that platform but whatever you know it was a good start. Unfortunately um, the policy response in uh, as far as I can see See, sort of petered out at some point. Um, the NCOC started off strong. There was a policy response. They made decisions about what would happen with educational institutions, about procurement of equipment for hospitals, about you know whether or not to have a lockdown. I mean, there was a lot of controversy on how that was affected. But you know, in the end, some important decisions were taken, and uh, and were implemented also to the extent that it could happen. The lockdown was a bit of a wishy-washy affair, but you know there were many reasons for that. Um, but I think that sometime after the second, after the first wave came and went, um, so the peak was reached around June, and by July, uh, when things started to get better, um, the policy sort response sort of was not coordinated anymore. It almost seemed to have faded out, um, and and. I think from August, September onwards, we are more or less seeing a business as usual sort of approach to what remains a crisis. In fact, there was a second uh, um, wave in uh, winter and again another peak in December. And it was just not uh, responded to in the same way. Yes, schools were closed again. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, there was a very half hearted attempt at a lockdown. There were messages from different ministers saying that, you know, it's still there, be careful. But, you know, no no coordination as such. I mean, there, uh, as always happens in Pakistan, other domestic problems and other political uh, developments occurred and, you know, the attention was shifted. And now we are seeing that again with the vaccine. I mean, the procurement has 
uh, Pakistan has now become one of the few countries to actually uh, start making arrangements for private procurement. Uh, and so far, all the vaccines that have come in have been donated. So there's no coordinated policy response to actually paying for a vaccine, booking uh, supplies, and you know, um, sort of distributing through the government. I mean, that's again, the policy response has kind of petered out. So that um, I would say that it started off with you know some degree of uh, efficiency, and then unfortunately it became business as usual. That's not so good. Um, I don't think business as usual is going to work very well in the future because what COVID has done is that it has exposed the fault lines in Pakistan's economy and society even more than was previously the case. So education is one area where it's come into sharp relief um, that you know children who go to government schools or to low-cost private schools have basically probably fallen behind significantly, do not have access. Even children who are taking online classes in Elite uh, private schools, I would say, very likely to have fallen behind because things, you know, uh, online classes, the experiences of parents and teachers tell us that it's not what it is uh, made out to be. So there are problems anyway. But uh, these, uh, for the elite sections of society who are able to at least, you know, uh, use computers and get into an online class, there is some hope. Um, for the vast majority, um, they're probably going to be. Uh, children have probably fallen behind quite seriously, so that's a problem. Um, as far as public health goes, I don't think we really know what's happened. I, it, it certainly seems as though we've gotten away without any major damage. <coughs> but we don't know um, if people have had infections and have not been tested or have had infections and are asymptomatic. We don't know what the long-term effects are. We don't seem to care. I mean, pub the public health-wise, this is not treated as an issue. I mean, the general idea is that most of the people who have died are older people. And in Pakistan, if you die after, after the age of 65, that's basically not a big deal. Um, I think in education, there are, there are severe fault lines. Um, in terms of provincial and federal coordination, things initially went well. And then, uh, you know, not so well. Um, I think it, this has exposed the fact that when when there's a crisis, the government is more interested in um, you know patching up rather than looking for long-term solutions. And we are not clear that the government is even thinking of long-term solutions uh, now. For instance, uh, uh, COVID has also highlighted some opportunities. I mean, remote working uh, you know may not be good for all sectors. But it may work in some cases, particularly in terms of bringing women into the workforce and with communication technology uh, progressing the way it has. Um, you know, like, for instance, telehealth services, um, you know, is an area which possibly in the future uh, the government should be looking into. Um, and I think that uh, COVID has, uh, you, you know, led to a situation where remote uh, medical um, consultations had you know, really caught on even in small cities. So that is something that should be looked at. Education, maybe not as much, um, you know, not for school children anyway, but maybe for higher education, you know, the possibility of virtual learning or virtual universities. Maybe there's there's a reason to explore that in more detail now. Uh, the other good thing uh, that could have come out of COVID, I'm not sure really whether that has been taken advantage of is that uh, COVID has uh, shown how, um, you know, keeping track of data and, you know, updating data systems and, and broadcasting and sort of disseminating data um, can be really helpful for policymakers. And uh, that is, again, something that should be uh, done, not just in a crisis situation, but for many other sectors where routine policy inputs are needed from time to time. So these are some of the main things that I'd like to highlight, and I'll let my colleagues speak now. Thank you, Safiya, for that broad overview of the sectors you were looking at, especially health and education, which, you know, cover a very broad ambit. And in your chapter, you were successfully able to, you know, compress them and, and bring out perspectives from what has changed. I'd like to ask Rafi what um, his uh, uh, was of, of environment, climate change, as well as, you know, the whole sort of ministerial uh, architecture that we have, the connection with uh, the international environment, the commitments that we have, 
and how good we may, uh, you know, how uh, our servicing of those uh, commitments year after year, we we have a posture where we we, we sort of um, present this idea that we feel very intensely about the environment and about the environmental cause in Pakistan, but really the COVID. Um, period, as Safiya said, exposed so many fault lines and environment just sits at the top of them. Rafi, over to you. You're on mute. Could you unmute yourself, please? Thank you, Salman. Well, I'll preface my remarks by reminding everyone that Jinnah Institute engaged a lawyer to write a chapter on health and climate change. And maybe that's why I couldn't see much of a connection. Health, from a legal point of view, from an administrative policy point of view, is, was, and should be a provincial matter. When the outbreak started, we saw friction between federal relief efforts and provincial relief efforts, especially the split between the federal government and the province of Sindh politically. And instead of seeing the flow of the constitution and the rule of law, see provincial capacities enhanced, uh, we saw instead the Supreme Court set in, uh, step in uh, with Suomoto action, directing the provinces to follow the federation's lead. And in this, then, the National Coordination Committee, uh, very much the brainchild of a military mind. Because you see, the problem of federalism in Pakistan is one of coordination not of centralization and that unfortunately is the primary thinking when your main job is to stand in front of a bullet the same is however true when you look at climate change climate change is a provincial subject it is something the provinces need to respond to because climate change impacts are local they are the most local of impacts when you run out of water it's a local impact when your village is flooded it's a local impact but what we have through some sort of mistake of constitutional history is a federal ministry of climate change in a policy position when really we should see the provinces breaking out and enhancing their own understanding and providing things like localized climate assessments. We don't see that at all. What we see is a federal structure that has been put up by the National Climate Change Act. We see that there should be a national climate change authority and a national policy. But the fact is that even though the act has been passed, the authority hasn't been staffed and the Climate Change Council, of which I am a notified member, has not met once uh, since the 2018 election, despite the brandishing of its green credentials by the ruling party. The fact is our policy is outdated. Um, it's from 2012. And the fact is that the subject is provincial and we don't have today the flow of the constitution and the rule of law and provincial capacities in this stead. So this is a reflection of how uh, centralization of COVID mirrors, you could say, the centralization of response when it comes to the climate crisis. And I just want to end that, you see, uh, I think again, when you have this issue of federalism, uh, a, a sort of conflict, not a conflict, but when you have issues that tread upon federal responsibility and provincial responsibility. Uh, the solution really is, like I said, coordination, not centralization. And that requires a sort of federal political thinking that includes coordination, give and take and communication. And when we saw the centralization of the response to COVID, it doesn't speak well for governance because we have a ruling party that's now renowned not to coordinate, not to communicate, and not to speak to other political parties. Um, so I see not very, well, I see rather gloomy mirrors, mirroring between the COVID response and what we have here uh, in terms of the climate response. And I just want to end by saying that, you know, the climate policy is outdated. And the, the science of climate crisis has moved on. We now know, you see, when the, climate crisis, when the climate policy was adopted in 2012, we had hoped that we'd be able to keep global temperatures to a degree and a half. And Pakistan's position, policy position in response to that was to set out mitigation and adaptation uh, initiatives or to spell them out in a policy that essentially saw a rosy picture of a degree and a half of global warming and no more. 
But just two weeks ago, the United Nations told us that the probability of remaining within two degrees of global warming, uh, which we expect to breach through by 2030, is less than 5%. And the difference between a degree and a half of warming and two degrees of warming has been estimated to be about 150 million deaths, mostly in Asian and African countries on account of air pollution associated with greenhouse gases. I'll remind you that this is more than four times the people who died in World War I and World War II put together. The circumstances that gave rise to Pakistan's policy position in 2012 have so starkly changed that Pakistan can no longer sit on its haunches and take its defense that it's a low greenhouse gas emitter. It has to take strides towards adaptation, which means no more construction packages, no more cons uh, sugar industry packages. You have to provide money where adaptation is needed. And when it comes to mitigation, we must stop believing that things like coal in abundance will be a solution when we know that fossil fuel energy based on NEPRA tariffs of last year are more expensive than renewable energies in Pakistan. So not only is it polluting to run a coal fired power plant, it's also more expensive. And I can't think of a reason why we continue to execute long term uh, contracts with international entities that bind us to a polluting and ecocidal future. Thank you. Thank you, Rafe, for that sharp critique of the political gridlock of where our federation stands and any issue climate change included will suffer as a, as a result of this rigidity and posture, which has, you know, longevity beyond any political issue, any, any policy issue. Uh, um, I think uh, Sama will also might also find um, you know his thoughts might might resonate with those on the front where where I find it very very difficult uh, where all doors are shut when governments of the center, as Rafi said, are unable to communicate, coordinate. Um, Osama, would you like to come in and give us perspectives from your chapter? Uh, sure, thank you. So um, I got a chance to look at uh, post-COVID futures from the lens of technology in Pakistan. Um, and I really looked at around five different questions. Um, but, but the first one uh, related to, you know, has technology assisted young people in livelihoods, education and information? And, you know, uh, like uh, Ma'am Safia also already mentioned um, that, that with, with the advent of the pandemic, we really saw uh, the proliferation of technology for livelihood, for education, for information and also health. Uh, so you saw this increased reliance on, say, um, technology, including the internet, for education. You saw a lot of people start to work from home. Um, and interestingly, in Pakistan, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've been in the top four nations in the world with the uh, highest percentage increase in revenue and employment for freelancers. Uh, so, so what that means is that a lot of people are now working from home, not directly employed with any particular organization, but freelancing their skills, uh, you know, from the ease of their laptop, wherever they are. Um, and, and that, that's, that's got to be a good thing, certainly for the youth, um, you know, that's increasingly technologically connected. But at the same time, there's um, a lot of issues that we saw, and you know, we've seen the we've seen the emergence of the digital divide, which has always been there. But we really saw the stark impact the digital divide can have, and essentially just further pronounce the inequalities that exist in our society. So in terms of, say, first of all, geography, we see that a lot of people in Pakistan still do not have access to the internet, even if they can afford it. So there's uh, multiple districts in Balochistan. Uh, most of the ex-tribal uh, areas, uh, FATA, that are now Khyber Pakhtunkhwa's merged districts do not have internet access. Internet access in Azad, Jammu Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan is also very sketchy. Um, so what we saw was a lot of students from universities from the larger cities in Pakistan move back to their hometowns because of the pandemic, but not 
uh, being able to access online educational classes because there simply was no internet in areas where they lived. Um, so, so that really, you know, brings out this issue of access. And if you look at the indicators, global indicators on the internet, also, Pakistan's lagging behind in terms of internet access. Um, and then, secondly, the issue of gender and technology is also very pronounced. So, in terms of uh, the percentage of women who are connected to the internet is way lower than the percentage of men that are connected, which is already, you know, a lot lesser than it should be. Um, and you know, that has to do with a lot of uh, cultural practices, but also uh, just priority being given to male offspring and women. The, the patriarchal you know, um, sort of resistance against women being connected to the rest of the world. So, so that in effect also impacts uh, girls' education, in which Pakistan is, you know, the number uh, second in the world for uh, a lack of women's education. Um, and then we've seen the proliferation of um, uh, technology when it comes to information also. So the reliance on social media as a source of information has been uh, increasing ever more with the, with the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, with that, we've seen a lot of issues such as mi misinformation um, come up, especially related to, say, vaccines. So in the past couple of years, we've seen how misinformation regarding polio was spread on the internet. Um, and uh, then I think a lot of the technology companies had to step in and assist the government in trying to take down those posts. And then we have saw that with COVID also. And right now there's a lot of resistance against the vaccine in many quarters of society. Um, so, so that's another issue that has to be looked at. Um, and then secondly, I looked at the, you know, whether technology has enabled positive participation in governance and politics. Um, and we've seen an increasing reliance on technology in the past few years. Um, uh, the government has uh, introduced the PM Citizen Portal, which is uh, an avenue for citizens to, you know, complain, uh, make complaints about many several uh, uh, government departments. And then what we've also seen is um, the government come up with an app for COVID-related tracking that people could download. Um, but in terms of technology, it was quite lacking, but also in terms of privacy, because a lot of the data was um, not secure or encrypted, and there was very little transparency as to how that was being processed. And uh, lastly, there was, there was um, issues with the efficacy of it as well. Uh, but other than that, we've seen a lot of these issues uh, find voice on the internet through social media. Uh, and that has been positive, especially for areas that were that are underserved by, say, the um, media, mainstream media as well, but also through uh, lack of internet access. A lot of those people, when they come to the cities, to areas where they have internet access, such as people from Balochistan and Fata and Gilgit, but this and are able to get their voice heard to a large extent. So, for example, we had uh, restored 3G and 4G in ex Fata trend on social media for several weeks in Pakistan, which led to a lot of action being taken. Um, I wouldn't call it meaningful uh, action because the prime minister has promised internet in ex Fata several times, but even now uh, they haven't got it yet. So just coming to what, what the government could do in terms of access. So already there's an existing universal service fund, uh, which is made up of 1.5% of the total revenue and annual, annual revenue of each telecom operator in the country. So we're talking billions of rupees. And the entire point of the universal service fund is to um, you know, subsidize uh, telecommunication connectivity in areas that are not served and which may not be profitable. So we've seen, I think, an allocation for one of the telecom companies to set up their towers in Moman Agency, uh, Moman District of Khyber Pukhtunkhwa, which is part of ex -Fata. Uh, But the rest of the six districts of ex remain underserved. Um, so there needs to be a 
I believe, more political will uh, to connect a lot of the areas that are not uh, connected. Um, and then I also looked at the, you know, whether the proliferation of te uh, telecom services have brought about inclusion for Pakistan's marginalized groups. And I think I touched upon this before, but we've seen uh, a lot of the marginalized communities use uh, the connectivity that social media brings out to have a voice on the internet. Um, and, you know, a, a, a very important example is the election of two members of National Assembly, Mohsin Dawar and Ali Wazir, who are both young and part of the uh, PTM. And because uh, it, it was a movement, movement largely fueled by noise on social media, led to a movement also becoming prominent enough for its members to get elected to the National Assembly. Um, so, so we've seen, uh, you know, technology increasingly used to bring out a lot of people uh, to prominence. But at the same time, we've also seen it um, being used for undermining a lot of people. So for example, we've seen um, a lot of disinformation campaigns linked with uh, you know, the state and the government against uh, voices that are critical of its policies. So be it human rights activists, be it journalists, um, or political opposition members have been um, targeted very viciously online and the government has been a mere bystander sander, and sometimes even instigator in all of this. So we've had the, the official handle of the ruling party, um, you know, uh, put out disinformation and personal attacks against uh, activists, politicians and against journalists. And I think that sort of policy, of course, um, requires a uh, a, a code of ethics, uh, but also more accountability and example setting by the leadership. Um, and then we uh, discussed a bit of, you know, has the government used technology for equitable benefit sharing? Um, and in that, I looked at a few policies. So, for example, the Punjab government in 2017 had started providing free Wi-Fi to citizens in some uh, pockets of the large cities in Punjab. Um, and uh, also, I think in Karachi, this was proposed, but then uh, just last year, the Punjab government rolled back on this. But I think um, uh, initiatives such as providing free internet and Wi-Fi to the public has to be something that has to be supported and perhaps a public-private partnership be um, formed in order to support this because um, Without that, you cannot expect a lot of the people to get connected. Um, and in terms of the policy front, we've seen around two or three different pieces of legislation and laws come about during the uh, you know time of the pandemic. So we saw the social media rules. Uh, so they were known as the Protection Against Citizen Harms uh, rules. And now the new revised draft is called Removal and Blocking of Unlawful Online Content, which talks about regulating social media content. Um, and I think that process has been a major, major um, mess uh, to put it mildly, because right now the, it's gone into the third revision of the laws uh, mandated by the Islamabad High Court and led by the Attorney General, Attorney General's office. Uh, we also saw the data protection um, bill be proposed um, and some consultation took place, but it's been a year and there's no news about you know any further progress on that. Uh, so I think these two pieces of law. Uh, have to be looked at much um, closely. And the major thing that's been lacking is a consultation of a, a multi-stakeholder consultative process in which people that are directly impacted and involved, uh, their uh, feedback is taken into account. And we see that messing, uh, sorry, missing. And that's uh, why these uh, you know pieces of laws and rules uh, leave much to be desired. And then lastly, I looked at the impact of large scale infrastructure projects um, uh, and whether they can enable greater connectivity and economic integration. So in that we looked at CPAC and how that has also enabled a lot of um, you know high speed internet connectivity through fiber optic cables that run through Pakistan uh, from China onwards to Gawadar and Karachi and into the Arabian Sea. So of course that's, uh, you know, will diversify our uh, internet bandwidth and uh, bring in a lot more traffic and uh, maybe help with speeds. Um, 
so that that's always a great thing but i think there are some policies linked with cpac uh, such as you know much greater surveillance by the state so we've had the web monitoring set up uh, web monitoring system set up which is something like a 32 million dollar project essentially carrying out surveillance of all internet traffic entering and leaving pakistan um, and then we've also seen a lot of, you know, expansive uh, surveillance mechanisms such as the safe city projects all over the cities uh, and with no data protection uh, regime governing any of that. So, so as we go um, in that partnership with China, I think it's important to we, uh, for us to uphold the constitutional rights of freedom of expression and privacy and uh, protect uh, and ensure that a lot of these infrastructural uh, projects also take into account protections of rights that may be violated uh, with that larger uh, infrastructure of surveillance and connectivity. Um, so I think that's just a, a high level summary of what I was able to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for that comprehensive view of your chapter um, and the way you've coordinated all of that. That's packs and packs quite a bunch. Safia, coming back to you, I, we've covered half the length of our uh, time. But if we could jump into recommendations, you have mentioned a couple of areas that you see as opportunities. Um, if there are recommendations from your chapter, what would they be? And if you could talk about healthcare education separately, as well as any number of initiatives you see, you mentioned telehealth as well, um, that, that you think will emerge as, as opportunities in the future. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you. Um, firstly, I think that uh, this example at least which happened initially of the federal and provincial governments coordinating during a crisis and <coughs> sorry you know meeting daily and you know taking decisions based on evidence so, you know we were being told that they were looking at data every day um i don't think that has continued but at least in the first two or three months it did and regardless of how that process was initiated um it was a good way to work you know uh, for a crisis situation definitely and even for uh, larger policy decisions, the Council of Common Interests has become such a contentious body um, that, you know, it, it, it barely meets now. Uh, it has barely met for many years. But uh, something like this shows us that there are ways to sort of coordinate and to work together and to, you know, base your, um, your policy initiatives on data, on evidence, and, you know, on a, an analysis. And that is something that can be carried forward regardless of the sector that you're working in. So I think that was an important lesson to be learned. And it's uh, disappointing that, you know, it, uh, we did not see many examples of that after, say, April or May. Uh, but definitely that is something that can be done. I talked about, uh, you know, the possibility of remote services in, uh, in medicine. And that is definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, an important takeaway. Um, I had mentioned that in education, this is less likely to be successful. But... Uh, um, yeah, and as Usama was mentioning, uh, what it has, what the COVID uh, experience has told us is that there's the digital divide is, um, you know, is, is very much prevalent. I myself, for another uh, report that I did for HRCP recently, I actually interviewed some students in on the on the phone in uh, Chitral and in um, Ghazar in the northern areas, and also in Balochistan. And I uh, was shocked to hear some of the experiences. I mean, you know, a young woman who's doing a bachelor's in physics in Kaide Azam University in Ghazar was actually walking to a nearby hillock near her house uh, in, in near the village and actually having to climb up this little hill. I mean, it's not a mountain, but, you know, having to climb up a little hill to get a decent signal on her phone, not any, not internet, just to get a decent signal on her phone to be able to sit in on, in class. Now, she's a university student and, you know, at least she has a phone that she can, you know, connect on. It was not an ideal situation, but she managed to do something. But there are many other examples. I talked to a young man in Sindh who had basically just completely missed all his classes and was just getting notes from friends and, you know, doing the best that he could. He could not connect onto any class. And that is something that, as Usama said, I absolutely agree. That's something that the government should look into urgently. And if fixed, if at all, uh, you know, uh, these things can, uh, this digital divide can be mitigated, 
it then provides a tremendous op opportunity for higher education that you know some sort of correspondence course or online education uh, opportunities can be made available and this would be important for women in particular although personally i don't think uh, it's a good idea for you know students to just stay at home and study um, for many reasons a university life is important but given the realities of our situation and the situation of many women in this country <coughs> um, it would be a it would be a big step forward to you know uh, at least carry uh, you know, at least advance online education. So that's another thing that uh, should be looked into. The technology is now there to be able to do many things that, you know, remotely that were previously not possible. But it's important to make sure that the digital divide is, uh, you know, mitigated. Um, and uh, apparently there are fairly cost effective solutions. I'm not a technical technology expert, but apparently there are cost effective solutions out there which can be used. Um, and then, I, as I said, uh, the effective use of data. So it's important to be able to, you know, uh, uh, analyze and to actually look at the evidence that you have. And um, I think that uh, the government has demonstrated, uh, NCOC has demonstrated that it's actually possible to uh, collect, analyze, and process data fairly efficiently if the government sets its mind to it. So again, these are important uh, takeaways. But uh, perhaps the single most uh, uh, important, the two most important points for me are coordination, um, the policy coordination across governments, uh, provincial and national, and uh, uh, to do something about the digital divide and then put that, uh, put the uh, better digital access to use effectively for social sectors. This is something that definitely can be done in the medium term. Thank you. Thank you, Safiya. Rafi, I'm still absorbing what you said in your last intervention. And, um, you know, I, of course, I'd, I'd like to hear on, on the recommendations you make and what your chapter has to say on how Pakistan can fix its um, environmental action. But let me throw in another question, if you'd like to answer it in any, in any way. Uh, you know, is, is then climate uh, a sector of the future for Pakistan, or does it become the historical ditch that we fall in? So, you know, uh, that's, I, I realize that's a bit of a philosophical question, but, uh, you know, if you can answer that, as well as, you know, any other points you'd like to respond to in Osama's or Safiya's intervention. Go ahead, Rafik. Thanks, Oman. My daughter, your children, our children will face a future and live in a future that's markedly different from the one that we grew up with and take for granted. Not just will their ecosystems be collapsing, not just will there be scarcity of resources, but governance itself will collapse in their lifetimes. That's how serious the climate crisis is. In my conclusion, I had drawn upon the, or rather tried to encapsulate the government's initial response Your picture's gone still, Rafi. Is does every is everybody facing a lag? Me. No, um, I'm facing problems as well. And by the way, uh, there's something going on with Nayatel these days. Um, they also sent a message saying that there's something wrong with the system. There's some underground cable which has been uh, damaged. So yeah, possibly but he's facing that problem. So we'll just wait for Rafi to dial back in. Um, Osama, same same question to work for you. Would you like to come in with your recommendations? Um, opportunities that you see are emerging. You have outlined some of them, um, and respond to any any other any other points that the other panelists raised. Go ahead, Osama. Um, yes, thank you. So there's a few recommendations that I make in the in the uh, chapter. Uh, so first of all, that resource allocation in the budget should also prioritize skill development, uh, especially related to uh, you know the digital realm and technology. Um, second, there should also be resource allocation for uh, expanding uh, access to the internet and technological services to you know uh, mitigate the digital divide. 
Um, and then third, um, that policy decisions related to the youth or technology must be done through a lens of rights so that you know the constitutional protections are not violated because it's very easy to do that. But the amount of data that you know the government and private companies have access to, it's very easy to violate that data and to influence uh, things negatively. And you know the example of the Cambridge Analytica scandal really showed us how um, a third party application with the help of a big techn technology company could even influence elections. Um, and at the end of the day, if we don't have strong data protection and privacy regimes, then our data is up uh, for grabs uh, for any bad actor, be it state, private, or otherwise, to do as they please with it. Um, and third, uh, uh, sorry, fourth, decision taking must be. Uh, transparent, consultative, and democratic rather than ad hoc and short term. Um, so this means that the decisions should consider inclusion of the diversity, of the groups that exist in the country, and make efforts to reduce the discriminatory device that exist in the digital and development policies that we see today. Um, and then lastly, human development for youth must not come from a framework of control, but instead of empowerment. So we've seen just in the past year, um, you know, the government block a video game, uh, block TikTok, a major entertainment application for young people. That's also a source of income for, um, you know, a lot of content creators. And we've also seen the government uh, try to bring in very draconian rules in order to control narratives on the Internet. And I think such uh, policies do us a lot more harm than good for the future. We've already suffered with a lot of censorship with YouTube being blocked for four years. You know, the content creator industry and the advertising industry in Pakistan um, lags behind the world because of that, because of what progress other countries were able to make within those four years was critical. Um, so I think all these considerations really need to be centered uh, in whatever policy the government makes. And if it's not consultative, um, then it's it's not likely to have as good an impact as it can. Um, and, you know, in the end, uh, we must realize, like, you know, my fellow panelists have also spoken about that technology is um, cross cutting. Uh, so you have uh, you can use it for to improve your health services, your governance, your education and all of these things. Uh, now increasingly rely on technology. So for us to take that seriously and enable greater access, but with protections. Thank you. Thank you, Usama. Sorry for that, Rafi. Thank you for joining us again. Go ahead. We, we heard a bit of what you had to say, but please resume with all the force uh, that you can summon. Well, I had concluded by saying that I saw a similarity between how the government initially prevaricated on the climate crisis and how it does the same, I'm sorry, with the pandemic and how it's doing the same with the climate crisis. You might recall the statement of the prime minister at the very beginning, Gabrana Nahihim, which is something similar you get when you speak to the folks at the Ministry of Climate Change, when you're informed that Pakistan is complying with all of its obligations under international climate agreements and that uh, we are a small greenhouse gas emitter and that we need money from the international global funds, uh, in, uh, climate funds to be able to do the mitigation and adaptation uh, that we have. And in any case, this government in turn, uh, I mean, this has been a stand not just of this government, from, but previous governments going back to as far as 2009, as far as I can remember. Uh, but this government, uh, what's unique here is that they brandish certain achievements of theirs, like the UNDP recognition of their uh, sustainable development goal towards uh, getting climate policies in place. Uh, they'll brandish the 10 billion tree tsunami and the recognition it's gotten them at forums uh, such as Davos. Uh, they'll speak of the import of Euro 4 fuels and of the electric vehicle policy and tell you that everything is okay. But this is not true. It wasn't true with COVID either. Uh, as I had mentioned in my earlier comments, the climate crisis is far worse than many people understand it to be. You see, given the difficulty and the challenges of the climate crisis, the elected representatives of Pakistan in 2007 decided the best way to deal with the climate crisis was to set up a climate council, which would uh, formulate policies to be implemented by a climate authority. 
uh, in the three or four years since the legislation has been passed, no government has actually followed through on that democratic mandate. And what we see instead with this government, instead of renewing the policy, instead of manning the authority, instead of having the prov provincial and local plans that the Act envisages, uh, what we see instead are these initiatives that the government is taking. And the thing is, each one of them can be criticized. The 10 billion tree tsunami is the subject of a suo moto before the Supreme Court. Euro 4 fuels may be imported into Pakistan, but you know, I'll wager you 100 rupees if you can find me a petrol station where one is available. And although the electric vehicle policy is ambitious, I fear that Pakistanis buy cars because of their cost, not necessarily to clean the air. So each one of these has their own challenges. They're all good initiatives, but they're challenges to be implemented and shouldn't just be accepted by a gullible public as measures of success. And the other thing is because they're initiatives of this government, they are also political. And so criticizing these initiatives or questioning these initiatives uh, then brings people under severe criticism uh, as to whether or not their political loyalties lie with this country or not. So I fear that uh, in conclusion, I say that uh, unlike the government of Pakistan and the prime minister, when it comes to the climate crisis, we will have to Mahathu, um, I sense that in these robust, highly dynamic presentations, we have packed in a lot more um, than I have heard in many, many webinars uh, held by governmental forums or even by decision makers in Islamabad who are responsible for taking decisions on all of these fronts. It does also seem to me that we may be looking at a rather prolonged pandemic, that being the title of this webinar, but inadvertently it's true, that we may be looking at a prolonged period where there is uncertainty on all of these fronts. And I have found this discussion to be very sobering. I think the report when it comes out in just a couple of weeks is going to, is going to present, is going to put out some very sobering truths for all of us. We are very much perhaps still stuck 30 years ago. Um, uh, 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 our policy supply lines, our decision making, but very fundamentally, the, the Cold War nature of our decision making and that mindset that has moved on in other parts of the world seems to have found a permanent home in Pakistan. Uh, I hope that we can move past it with greater urgencies, emergency prone as we are. But um, with with these views in front of us, it just you know um, it tells people like me that there is there is a far longer struggle ahead. Um, I have found the discussion very insightful, as I am sure that people who watch this will as well. I thank you, experts, very much for your time. And um, in due course, we will be sharing the, the finalized report with you and uh, invite you to perhaps another webinar, another online launch. I thank you very, very much again for having written for us and for joining us in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you have the live stream?